get on time. Right. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Mahindra Mehra. I am MD of Sonoscape Medical for uh, South Asia region. On behalf of Sonoscape, I proudly welcome all of you in this today's informative and ex exciting webinar session. Sonoscape is presently leading in ultrasound innovative technology with breakthrough advanced color Doppler range, especially with integrated AI, that is artificial intelligence tools and features. As we all see, we are now surrounded by AI technology, which simplifies our day-to-day -day life in every aspect. So taking lead in AI, the Sonoscape high-end high futuristic color Dopplers help clinicians to drastically reduce the scan time and improving the diagnostic confidence through automation of scans. As we, as we are presently fighting the invisible enemy of coronavirus, we all will agree that faster scans will be the new norm of ultrasound scans. And Sonoscape has already taken a big leap with integrated AI, big data algorithms, deep learning, and which, which are assisting the doctors in wide range of clinical applications. So uh, I'm, I'm already seeing a full house, uh, a jam-packed house of this webinar with probably 1,100 plus participants. Uh, but I see still more participants are entering the virtual webinar room. So I'll just take you through a few slides uh, of our Sonoscape high-end color Dopplers which clearly demonstrate how our AI tools are uh, making an innovative benefit to the uh, users and the doctors. So without taking much time, as you see, our high-end color Dopplers are already uh, loaded with patient big database, and we extract, and which enables uh, auto recognition of the ultrasound images for different ap applications because of the AI deep learning algorithms. And the best part is, it's not only restricted to uh, one particular application, the Sonoscape AI is available for wide range of applications, right from ops, gynae, MSK, breast, thyroid, etc. So what's the benefit? Benefit, as I just mentioned, is totally auto acquisition for different scans, auto identification of uh, organs and lesions, Shortened scan times, automation, <laughs> with a single touch of button. So this helps in a faster, intelligent scan in all different applications, as you are able to see, with clear identification of the right plane, identification of the structures. So without taking much time, as you see, the Sonoscape high-end premium color dopplers are loaded with a wide variety of probes and clinical most advanced applications. And probably Sonoscape high-end products are the only available shared service whole body color. Dollars. And it's just a glimpse of uh, such a big, uh, applications and images which you are able to see, especially uh, I'm displaying here 3D and 4D. So and now I hand over to our uh, eminent speaker and expert teacher, Dr. TLN Praveen from Abhishek Scan Center, Hyderabad, who needs no introduction. Dr. TLN Praveen, sir, with his numerous national and international session, publications and articles, has been source of in-depth knowledge for all of us for years. I welcome you, Dr. TLN, sir. And now you can take control of the presentation. Uh, good evening, everybody. Hope I am audible. Uh, uh, yes. And uh, in this um, tough scenario, the first and foremost thing I would like to know is, hope everyone is doing well and uh, staying safe. That is the most important thing that we have to be as of today. Now, in this difficult situation of uh, social isolation, I think uh, uh, Sonoscape has done a wonderful job by uh, having this webinar so that we can interact with each other and uh, at least try to be um, uh, digitally close. Now with this, 
I would like to start off, and at the same time, I would like to thank uh, the Sonoscape team, particularly Mahendra Mehra, as well as uh, Gaurav, who has really worked very hard to get this into place. Now, um, I'll share my screen and then go into this so that I can put my presentation on. From there onwards, I will take you through various slides which I, I would like to project. Now, uh, this particular topic has been, um, I mean, uh, when um, Sonoscape approached me for a webinar, uh, they said that they wanted something which is absolutely basic, quite often used, extremely useful in our day-to-day -day ultrasound practice. So keeping that in mind, as we all know, almost about 60 to 70% of our workload will be in evaluating mid-trimester fetus. So keeping that in mind, I have chosen this particular topic in order to uh, enumerate the various methods that we are going to follow in systematically evaluating various aspects of the fetus. Now, coming to the objective, it's very essential that we need to provide accurate diagnostic information because based on that information, the antenatal care will be optimized. Not only that, this particular method is basically used in, in the mid-trimester in order to evaluate the gestational age. Gestational age by various biometric parameters. And once you have assessed the gestational age and assigned a gestational age based on ultrasound, then we are sure about the growth pattern which the fetus is following. Based on that, growth abnormalities can be detected. Then at the same time, we all know the second trimester, particularly between 18 to 22, is an ideal situation where we try to evaluate various fetal abnormalities. Now, this uh, method or this process is uh, being practiced by following certain guidelines which have been laid down by ISUOG as well as AIUM. But one most important thing which I would always suggest and uh, would like to practice is our local guidelines are extremely useful. The reason being that uh, that we have, we have uh, uh, designed these protocols based on our local needs or local conditions. So that's the reason that they are much more useful to us in our day-to-day -day practice. That's one aspect of it. The second most important aspect of it is that we have the Society of Fetal Medicine who has proposed and published mid-trimester anomaly scan protocols. So these are the various things that we can use in evaluating the mid-trimester fetus. Now, why should we follow these guidelines? What do they tell us? They tell us when to do the scan. They also tell us who should do the scan. And it also gives us a guideline or guidance regarding the equipment that we are going to use. At the same time, various uh, uh, measuring calipers, which can be useful in accurately measuring the, uh, the structures which we are going to image. And at the same time, this equipment should always have a capability of printing the images as well as storing the images. And documentation is the most important thing that because whatever you have seen, unless it is put into the report format, it will not be useful to the patient or to the referring clinician. At the same time, one most important thing that we all should realize is that all of us are uh, I mean, not I mean, infallible. Most of us have certain limitations. And whenever we have a problem which we are not able to solve properly, it is always advisable to send it to a better center or an advanced center where they have advanced equipment and same time have operators who are more experienced. So this is one thing that we should inculcate into our system. Now, when do we do the mid-trimester scan? We all know that it is ideally done between 18 to 22 weeks of gestation. And who should do? Everyone who has been routinely performing obstetric scans should be allowed to do it. Only thing is they need a little specialized training to perform mid-trimester anomaly scans. The equipment that we use is basically a real-time grayscale imaging method and in which we use about 3 to 5 megahertz transducer, a curvy linear transducer or a linear transducer. And also having the facility to adjust the acoustic power. This is an extremely important aspect of an equipment. That is, you are going to control the energy that has been generated by the sound. So this way, you are following what is called as Alara principle, which is what is nothing but the as low as reasonably achievable. So that the, the, uh, 
the uh, the ill effects or the side effects of uh, the ultrasound beam which is exactly an energy is going, can be avoided now uh, the calipers and then with uh, ai coming into practice we all now are very comfortable using ai particularly in biometry because it saves a lot of time uh, this same time which we were using to achieve the biometric parameters now we can use that time in evaluating various other abnormalities uh, or evaluating more critical situations now coming to the documentation this is one thing which we all should in, in, uh, practice that is we have to document what we have seen there is no second thought about it the most important thing at this juncture i would like to say is if you are unable to see a particular structure it is always advisable to make the patient wait for some time call them back reevaluate it after doing multiple times uh, reevaluation in spite of that if you cannot make out the the uh, or satisfactorily image a particular structure it is always better to put it in the uh, report form saying that uh, that this particular one has been repeatedly evaluated the number of times you have evaluated and in spite of that i am unable to make out this particular structure so that gives you lot of uh, honesty it gives you credibility not only that it is legally safe so keeping these things in mind that's how the uh, guidelines help now after so listening to all these things we all know that it's a huge task to do a multi uh, mid transfer normally scan which actually needs a systematic approach at the same time lot of common sense these are the two things that are extremely required in evaluating mid transfer features now what is the solution for it the solution that has been proposed is that we follow what is called as the two sweep 20 plane approach now when we talk about this two plane a two overview 20 plane approach this is the one which actually provides us a structured logical method of examining the mid range surfaces in this there are two most important components one is to measure various structures and we know normally in a mid trimester there are four structures that we try to evaluate one is the hyperacal diameter the second one is the head circumference the third one is the abdominal circumference as well as the fetal femur length that is one long bone but there are any number of measurements that you can take in the fetus and all these measurements have got normogram charts which can be used in order to assess the gestation age or assign the gestation age ultrasound based now coming to the anatomical survey is one of the most important aspects of the mid trimester scan and by doing following this uh, two overview 20 plane approach we can exclude more than 50 fetal abnormal appearances so this is very very important thing this is an extremely novel method that has been proposed in systematizing our approach to evaluating the mid trimester fetus now what does this two overview and 20 plane mean in which we have two overview sweeps and 20 planes which cover almost seven anatomical areas these two two overviews are categorized as one in the beginning of the scan the second one at the end of the scan the one which we start uh, the initial scan, the overview or the sweep is what is called as the survey sweep as the name itself indicates it is the survey of the whole of the uh, the gravid uterus that you are going to do the second one is the review sweep is that after finishing all the 20 planes you would like to go back and see certain important areas whether you have missed something so this is how the approach is as far as the two, two overview sweeps are concerned now these 20 planes are extremely important because each fetal structure has multiple planes for example if you take fetal spine we at least do three planes to evaluate the fetal spine spine that is one is the coronal section two is the sagittal section three is the transverse section so each of the fetal structures have got a specific multiple planes that are designed in order to evaluate various aspects of that particular anatomical structure now not only that along with it in each of these planes you do the measurements and at the same time each of these planes have got number of structures to be evaluated and this actually enables us to identify at least 50 abnormal fetal appearances fetal abnormal fetal appearances or abnormal appearances or abnormalities by taking taking uh, following or practicing this two sweep or two overview and 20 plane method now the reference documents are 
we have the ECO uh, guidelines or the uh, practice guidelines that have been published and there are various other practice guidelines that are also available like AIUM and SFM which can also be used to follow the guidelines. Now the ECO guidelines have specifically spe specified stating that whenever you try to evaluate the mid to scan or mid to fetus, you need to go from the head to head, face, neck, chest, thorax, as well as the abdomen and skeletal system and all others like plasma and paramelical cord, amniotic fluid. Of course, the genitalia we don't do in India, but then still it is one of the incorporated uh, protocols that are, that are being followed world over. Now, remember one most important thing that uh, we should be aware of, because if you go methodically using the, the same protocol saying that I will start off examining the fetus only by the head, then go to spine, then go to abdomen and then come to heart, that is not the really practical. The reason is that you need to be opportunistic. What do you mean by being opportunistic? It is being that you are going to utilize the fetal position. Suppose, for example, the fetal face as well as the fetal heart. There are two dynamic structures. Unless the fetus is in an appropriate position, you will not be able to see the fetal face nor the fetal heart. So the idea is, or being opportunistic is that whenever the fetus shows its face or whenever the fetus is in an appropriate position to evaluate the fetal heart, please complete examining the fetal heart or the fetal face in that position. That is one. Second important thing is that there are certain structures that are extremely important to be identified, such as the fetal stomach as well as the urinary bladder that should be looked for immediately the moment you do a survey scan or the initial overview. And then whenever it is possible, try to see the fingers as you are doing the survey scan when the fetus opens its uh, fingers, particularly in the mid trimester, when the fetus opens its hand, it is always advisable to see. Of course, more, none of the protocols indicate that you need to evaluate the fetal fingers in, in general. But then still, if you can make out, it's well and good. Now, coming to this uh, two sweep uh, 20 plane method, one first over, uh, overview or the first sweep is the beginning sweep, which is normally done by placing your transducer in a longitudinal or a sagittal section. You can go from one side of the, of the gravity uterus to the center and to the opposite side, or you can start from the center and move towards the right and move towards the left. So by doing this, there are certain factors that you are going to look for. That is one, the fetal position, fetal line, amount of liquor, the, the, the general survey of the location of the placenta and all these things can be made out by just doing the initial uh, overview of, this, uh, of the, what they call as the screening sweep. Then comes various structures like the spine. The evaluation of spine is done by three planes. That is the sagittal coronal as well as the transverse. Fetal head is done by another three planes. We all know that these are the three basic planes which we use in evaluating the fetal brain. Then we have the fetal thorax, which is being used, uh, which is being evaluated by doing four planes. One is the most important thing is the transsection of the fetal thorax at the level of the four chamber view, which gives us not only the four chamber view, but also gives us idea regarding the normalcy of the fetal lungs. Then we have the left and right ventricular outflow tracts, as well as the three vessel trachea view. These are the basic things that we need to look for as far as the, uh, the, the, the sectional planes are concerned. Then regarding the abdomen, we do the transverse section of the abdomen. As well as the transverse section of the abdomen, we do another three planes. One is the transsectional abdomen, where you would look for the fetal stomach as well as the umbilical vein. The second one is the transverse section of the abdomen, particularly you would like to know the insertion of the umbilical cord because it has a very important role to play. Then the third one is the transverse section of the fetal kidneys. But then remember, all these things are basic things. I would like, I will take you through the extended examination of these various anatomical structures so that we know we will have a comprehensive idea about what we are looking for. Then coming to the pelvis, the transsection of the pelvis includes evaluation of the fetal bladder as well as the umbilical identification of the umbilical number of umbilical arteries. Then we have the limbs. The, particularly, the one section is basically intended to evaluate the fetal femur length on both sides. Remember this statement that, that is on both sides because Unilateral hypoplastic uh, femur is one of the conditions which we always have to keep in mind. Then the next one is the evaluation of the legs where we take 3 plus 3 plus 3 that is femur, tibia, fibula and uh, on the left side, on the right side again, tibia, uh, femur, tibia and fibula. 
Similarly, in the arms also, you take the radius, I mean the humerus, radius, ulna on both sides. Then comes the fetal phase. Fetal phase is one of the most trickiest situations because unless you get a proper section, you cannot be confident in labeling it as normal. One of the most important planes that we are going to use is the coronal plane where we try to evaluate the fetal nose, nose with the nostrils, the upper lip, the lower lip and the chin. I will show you all the images, don't get worried. And then next section is the, the orbital section where we take the, both the orbits as well as the, the lens within it. And then the medial facial profile or the facial profile which we can take on the sagittal section. Then the last one is the, the last overview or the review sweep. The review sweep is actually done in a transverse plane where you take the transducer right from the, uh, the, the, the rump to the, the cervical or fetal head. So that this way you are going to once again cursorily, subjectively look for various anatomical structures which you, you, you would like to reaffirm that what you have seen in all these planes are absolutely normal or abnormal. Right. With this background, let me take you to first and foremost thing which we quite often use in the mid trimester scan is the fetal biometry. And as I said, these are the three, four structures or the four parameters that we depend upon. One is the bipedal diameter. The second one is the head circumference. The third one is the abdominal circumference and then the, the, the fetal femur length. Now, there are certain anatomical landmarks that we have to follow in order to accurately standardize the measurement of these things which I think most of you are aware of. Basically, what we need to do is the, the bipedal diameter and head circumference is basically uh, uh, evaluated when the fetal, fetal head is examined in transthalamic plane. This is the, from the Kevum septum pellucidum. That is the midline hemispheric, uh, hemispherical fissure, thalamus on either side. And this is the plane where you would like to take the bipedal diameter as well as the abdominal circumference. Whereas if you come to the abdominal circumference, Basically, it all depends on the fetal position. If the fetus is in supine or in the lateral positions, we always depend upon the stomach as well as the umbilical vein. The umbilical vein taking a curve, that is what is called as the hockistic appearance, or you can identify the umbilical vein in the junction of posterior two-thirds to anterior one-third. If the fetus is in prone position, you may not be able to evaluate or see the umbilical vein. In that situation, what we need to do is we depend on the adrenals on either sides and the stomach on the left side. So these are the basic landmarks that we are going to follow in evaluating these things. Similarly, the fetal femur, basically you all know that we would not like to measure the femur, uh, femur uh, the neck of the femur. The head of the femur is there, but it is uh, cartilaginous. That's the reason why you cannot see. So basically, whenever the most of the normogram charts are designed to measure the fetal femur from the greater trochanter, to the distal end and the distal end is identified by identifying a, a, a artifact what is called as the distal femoral line okay so these are the basic landmarks that we are going to use in evaluating this now we have what is called as the ai ai in evaluating the fetal uh, biometry this actually um, makes our life more comfortable because they have acquired millions of uh, images and have stacked them up. And these images, when you take an image of the fetal head, it is correlated or I mean, matched to the millions of images they have. And immediately you get the exact measurements and the exact section also will be identified. So that is one thing which helps us because it saves a lot of time and it gives you an accurate measurement of these structures. Similarly, this can also be used in evaluating the fetal brain, I'm sorry, fetal abdomen, if you see manually, when you want to take the abdominal circumference, you need to, uh, the working time is almost 29 seconds. And they say it is keystrokes all about about 14. And whenever this AI use is used, the working time becomes four seconds and the keystrokes is only one. So this is one of the advantages, major advantages, which we are going to have by saving a lot of time and utilizing this time in evaluating various other aspects of the fetus. This is applied in various aspects, that is the head circumference, bipedal diameter, abdominal circumference, fetal femur, humerus length, as well as auto NT. This basically is due to a deep learning process that has been based on and it gives a better accuracy and uh, most important thing is reproducibility. So that is one thing which we have to be keep, kept in mind. Now, coming to the fetal spine, now let us start off with the clinical application of various anatomical abnormalities that we are going to identify. 
the one of the anatomical planes or the anatomical structures that we are going to evaluate is the evaluate examination of the fetal spine as we all know the fetal spine is exact basically evaluated in three sections that is the transverse section this is the axial section this is the coronal section and this is the sagittal section sometimes it may be very difficult to get the coronal section in that situation you can use what is called as the 3d uh, uh, acquisition wherein you can get what is called as multiplanar display of uh, orthogonal planes that is the axial that is the acquisition plane and we have the sagittal as well as the coronal planes which are being simultaneously displayed which help us in identifying various abnormalities which is single stroke now coming to the fetal head these are the three style sections that we are going to deal with i am going to take you in detail each of these things but basically you need to understand that these are the basic actual views that we use in evaluating the fetal brain particularly with the transventricular plane transthalamic and transcerebellar planes then we have the fetal heart and the thorax particularly fetal heart we take at the the transverse section of the fetal heart uh, where you have the four chamber view and then we have to tilt your transducer or sweep your transducer in such a way that you can identify the left ventricular outflow tract as well as the right ventricular outflow tracts then we have the fetal lung or the fetal thorax basically you need to see the configuration of the thorax and not only that you always remember that the fetal lung is slightly echogenic than the liver or the spleen the reason being that the alveoli are filled with the fluid that is the reason why it is much more echogenic than the liver or the spleen and that is one thing which helps us in identifying the diaphragmatic contour this is the diaphragmatic contour we can see this both in the sagittal as well as in the transverse sections or the axial sections now then comes the fetal abdomen in the fetal abdomen basically we start off evaluating the fetal abdomen by taking a transverse section of the umbilical vein here there are certain important aspects that we need to understand one is to identify the relationship between the aorta as well as the inferior vena cava then you can see the the presence of the stomach uh, this is the stomach and you can see the umbilical vein being directed towards the opposite side and you can see the adrenals on either side and the fetal kidney as i am sweeping the transducer down towards the pelvis and seeing the umbilical cord insertion now you can also put the pellet doppler and try to evaluate the abdominal aorta as well as the renal arteries in certain situations where we are not sure about the about the fetal kidneys either unilateral or bilateral absence of the fetal kidneys this is a very confirmative method of uh, uh, of identifying a unilateral or uh, bilateral renal agencies then comes the 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 identification of umbilical arteries on either sides of the bladder which skirts the bladder and then insertion of the umbilical cord into the anterior abdominal wall is again an important uh, feature that we have to identify now coming to the fetal extremities as i said the extremities first and foremost thing most often the first most important thing is that at least one section one image of both the femurs should be there and you should measure them appropriately then you can measure all other uh, all other things or you can just have a cursory look to see that all other bones are normal or are present or they are they are normal in echo texture and mineralization as well as there is no molding of abnormalities now what is the relevance of these two and uh, two sweeps and 20 planes the most important thing is that you will be understanding the normal ultrasound appearance in each of these planes as one we will be able to understand the normals and abnormals or differentiate between normals and uh, normal variations at the same time you will also understand the normal measurement ranges by using these techniques now when we start off with the initial sweep the basic initial sweep tells us the the fetal position first and foremost thing it tells us the lie of the fetus not only that it also tells us the presenting part for example you take this one you know whether the fetus is in the transverse lie or in the in the, in the longitudinal lie and then we also know whether it is the cephalic presentation or the breech presentation and then we also know whether the occiput is on to the left or occiput is on to the right so these are the information that is that is can that can be immediately obtained now there has been a wonderful paper that has been published by alfred abu ahmed where he has specified there are standard six steps approach in performing a focused basic abnormal obstetric ultrasound examination which was published in 2016 in american journal of perinatology where he has specified these six steps where we can use eyeballing to identify these things these six steps are first and foremost thing is the determination of fetal presentation as well as the lie which i have already shown you then uh, identifying the viability of the fetus detection of fetal cardiac activity identification of number of fetuses and determination of the location and the position of the placenta 
as well as the amniotic fluid amo amo amount of amniotic fluid and the fetal biometric measurements so these are the basic things that you are going to do by using the first uh, uh, what is called as the survey sweep and these are the six things that you have to look for when you do the survey sweep then with this you progress on to the uh, 20 plane approach now in the 20 plane approach let us first start off with the fetal spine in the fetal spine basically as i said we would like to see the sagittal kernel and the axial views the reason why we need to look for them the sagittal plane is basically intended to identify the intact skin so basically when you do a sagittal scan what we need to understand is that you need to appreciate or can identify or image the whole length of the spine right from the cranio cervical junction to the sacrum normally the sacrum will be curved as well as it will be tapering this is one thing which we should always remember not only that in this we can identify nicely the skin being intact or there is any any uh, breach in the continuity of the fetal skin which helps us in identifying certain abnormalities the second important thing in the sagittal scan is that in the in, in the development of the fetal vertebral body basically we all know that the spinous process get ossified only in the neonatal period initially they are all having a cartilaginous area so this cartilaginous area which is seen on the spine or the spinous process of the uh, the the spine will allow you to see the intrathecal spinal cord you can see beautifully the intrathecal spinal cord clearly identified and not only that you can see the whole uh, cord and at the same time you can see the tapering which can be seen which is because of the cord equina and also the phylum terminal can be seen and not only that you can also see some amount of uh, fluid along the dorsal aspect of the uh, cord which is extremely important in identifying subtle uh, open neural tube defects now the second important thing is the coronal section the coronal section is a little tricky and little difficult to obtain by 2d examination but sometimes you struggle a little bit you can definitely get an image like this where you can see the vertebral bodies very nicely and in case if you can't you can use the volume rendering and let's say you can get the spine very nicely as you can see here you can see the sacrum going beyond the iliac bones that is one two any vertebral body abnormality like hemi vertebra block vertebra butterfly vertebra can be easily identified in this particular plane and another important thing is the 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 widening of the spine can also be identified whether it is widened or whether it is narrowed can be easily picked up by that you can identify certain intrathecal space occupying lesions or certain uh, structures like vas metamidia where there is a bony spur or a cartilage spur which is dividing the canal so this is the overview that is basically used in order to identify that then comes the axial view axial view or the transverse section where we have most important thing three components one is the vertebral body this is the one which throws a lot of shadow in then one then we have the costo transverse junctions then we have the lamina on either sides as i said the spinous process is there but it is cartilaginous it is not it ossified that is the reason why you can use this as a window to evaluate the the cord which is seen at the center of the canal so this is how you are going to evaluate the thing at the same time this also will be useful in identifying the uh, intactness of the skin and you need to know remember that there should be it is a it's like a equilateral triangle if it is like an equilateral triangle any alteration in this will will definitely help us in identifying certain of the maladies now coming to the fetal head planes the basic planes which we are already aware of are the transventricular transthalamic transcerebellar planes these are the sections that are taken this is this is the trans uh, thal thalame that is the transventricular and that is the transcerebellar where you are inclining your transverse from the posterior fossa to the to the frontal region now this is these are the three sections that you again i have shown you now we'll just take i mean basically i am not going into details of each and every structure but i am giving you an overview of all these structures where in the transventricular plane the structures which we are going to do look for are first and foremost in the interhemispherical fissure this is the callosal sulcus we have the frontal horns on either sides and you have a rectangular box like structure which is fluid filled at the center which is called as the cavum septum pellucidum it is usually located at the junction of anterior one third to the posterior two thirds of the fox cerebrae and as you progress posteriorly you have the interhemispherical fissure and a small slit like the third ventricle and you have the the the, as the, the, the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles and the echogenic choroid plexus 
this is the parieto occipital uh, sulcus which is the landmark which is used to in order to measure the ventricle so the ventricular measurement is taken from inner to inner and it is usually normally it is about 10 so as we are talking about the transventricular plane as we as the name indicates we need to look for the ventricles first and foremost in the anterior horns then we have the posterior horns as well as the atrium which is because of the filled with, with the choroid plexus echogenic choroid plexus now the posterior horn uh, of the lateral ventricle is measured from the, uh, the uh, point where at the level of the right occipital sulcus which i have already told you the upper limit of normal is about 10 millimeters we have the triangular or rectangular remember this has two shapes one it could be triangular or it could be rectangular cavum septum pedestrum which is actually skirted on either sides by the lateral ventricles so the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles now coming to the transthalamic plane this is the plane which we are going to use for our bipartial diameter as well as the as well as the uh, head circumference in this again we have uh, structures like interhemispherical fissure frontal horns cavum septum pedestrum slit like third ventricle at the same time, thalami on either side, hippocampus gyrus, and partly you can see the posterior horns as well as the choroid plexus, and most importantly, the sylvian fissure can also be seen. So these are all the structures which you are going to look for as far as the thalamic plane is concerned. So when I am describing each of these planes, I am telling you what are the structures that we are going to look for and what are the structures we are supposed to look for, so that these are the ones which can help us in picking up abnormalities. Now coming to the transcerebellar plane, here again, we do see some amount of uh, the frontal horns because you are angulating your transducer from the occipital region to the frontal region. So do see the cavum septum pellucidum, frontal horns, interhemispherical fissure. And most important thing, you can see this dumbbell shape, the cerebellar hemispheres, you can see the echogenic vermis, and then you can see the cisterna magna and then the Blake's pouch. And also you can identify the nuclear pack thickness, that is the distance between the outer aspect of the occipital bone to the inner aspect of the skin fold thickness. Now, the transcerebellar plane is one of the most important things where you can identify the cerebellar hemispheres. They are usually H-shaped or dumbbell-shaped. And most important thing is they are hypoechoic. And when you want to take the transcerebellar distance, if the transcerebellar distance is extremely useful because it tells us about the abnormalities of the cerebellum, that is, whether there is any hypoplasia of the cerebellum, then second important thing is it usually corresponds to the, by the, the gestational age in weeks, the, the number of millimeters of transcerebellar distance will be equivalent to that many weeks of gestation. It is usually appropriate till about 26 weeks of gestation. Then we have Blake's pouches, which is seen as a posterior output of the fourth ventricle, which is filled with clear fluid. And it is seen in the center of the, uh, the uh, cisterna magna. And uh, basically, the differentiation between the cisterna magna and the Blake's pouch is because of clear fluid in the Blake's pouch and corpusculated fluid in the, in the cisterna magna. Then we can measure the anterior posterior diameter or the depth of the cisterna magna, and it should be not more than 10 millimeters. And the fourth ventricle in this plane is not seen. But then when you modify the, the, the plane, as you can see here, this is what's called as the occipitopragmatic view, where you can see the cerebellar hemispheres, you can see the rectangular echogenic vermis, you can see the fourth ventricle just in front of it, which has to be uh, identified in this particular view. So these are the various things that you are going to look for as far as the fetal uh, uh, basic actual views are concerned. This particular section, that is the mid sagittal plane, is an extremely important one because most of the midline abnormalities can be identified by using this particular plane. As we know, the mid sagittal plane, the carpus callosum and the vermis are the midline structures. And we, when you do a mid sagittal plane, you need to demonstrate both of them in the same plane. As you can see here, that is the carpus callosum, that is the cavum septum pedestrum, and that is the vermis. So this is an extremely important thing. And not only that, as you can see in this particular section, you can see the the thalamus, midbrain, or uh, the brain stem, and then the medulla, uh, that is the, the pons and the medulla blanca. Right? So this is not an appropriate section. I'll show you when you can you can see the posterior fossa or the middle side. Not only that, in this particular section, we would like to really assess the carpus callosum because one of the commonest problems which we have often face is the uh, abnormalities of the carbon, uh, carpus callosum. This carpus callosum is a, high, uh, a curvilinear structure, which is actually a hypoechoic band. And this hypoechoic band is layered by a hyperechoic area, one by the callosal sulcus, the other by the cavum septum, the roof of the cavum septum perostrum. It has uh, four parts, that is the rostrum, rostrum, that is the rostrum, uh, genu, as well as the body, and then the splenium, 
and the whole of it can be seen by 20 weeks of gestation uh, and at the same time when you want to measure you can measure from the rostral or length or you can also take the thickness at various parts of the, uh, the cerebellum. Now coming to the vermis, vermis is also an extremely important midline structure and vermian abdominalities are extremely uh, important to be identified. We need to properly uh, the, uh, the, uh, evaluate or image the vermis and vermis appears as an echogenic bean-shaped structure. This basic echogenicity is because of dense folia which you see as because of the uh, pile enfolding. Now, this triangular structure which you see is the, the fourth ventricle and this tip is the vestigium that is the apex of the fourth ventricle which actually acts as a hilum of the vermis. Now, you can see a dimple here which is because of the primary fissure. This is the primary fissure which divides the vermis into upper one third and lower two thirds. So, these are the anatomical landmarks that we need to identify. Not only that, the vermis can also be measured by taking the craniocaudal and also the AP diameter. You can also take the, the area of the vermis. You can also assess the rotation of the vermis by drawing what is called as the brainstem vermian angle. So these are the things that we are going to look for as far as the fetal head is concerned. Uh, then comes the fetal chest as well as the heart. In this, the most important thing which we should realize is that heart is a dynamic structure. So when you are evaluating a dynamic structure, it's always essential that you need to do a real-time examination. And whenever you do a real-time examination, you please capture the cine loops as far much as possible so that these are the cine loops which you can replay and try to evaluate the structures whichever they are in doubt. So uh, magnifying the uh, fetal heart, there is, there is what is called as the uh, optimization of fetal heart uh, uh, imaging which uh, basically intends the magnification, the cine loop acquisition and decrease the frame rate, decreasing the, uh, sorry, the increasing the frame rate so that you can see the uh, fetal heart in a better way. Now, first and foremost thing, we need to look for the presence of the heart activity. Then you need to establish the situs, that is what is called as the laterality of the fetus. Then we need to evaluate the various aspects of the fourth chamber, LVOT, RVOT, and in the lungs, we need to take the sagittal section of the thorax so that you can identify the hemidiaphragms on other sides and either sides. Lung echogenicity has to be evaluated and that has to be compared in relation to the liver as well as the spleen. Presence or absence of any echogenic or cystic areas have to be identified. Mediastinal shift is one of the most important things which can be associated with various congenital diaphragmatic hernias as well as lung lesions. Now, whenever we try to evaluate the fetal heart, there is what is called as the, the uh, sequential e examination of the fetal heart in which we start off from the fetal abdomen and take a sweep uh, all along the from the fetal abdomen to the upper mediastinum. When you do that, you acquire seven sections. These are the seven sections that you acquire. The first and foremost thing is the fetal abdomen, where you can see the stomach here, you can see the iota, you can see the inferior vena cava, which are extremely important. Then you can see the fourth chamber view, then the left ventricular outflow tract, right ventricular outflow tract, and the bifurcation, which is also known as the short axis view. And then we have the three vessel trachea view, and then the arch view, that is the, this is the, the, the uh, aortic arch, and that is the, the ductal arch. So these are the things that you have to look for whenever you are trying to evaluate the fetal heart. Now, let us start off using these planes. When you do a uh, planes where you can do the four chamber view, as you can see here, you can take the four chamber view. At the same time, you can uh, get the, um, the, the, the left ventricular outflow track and the right ventricular outflow track. This is what is called as the sweep technique. You start off evaluating the fetal heart right from the fetal abdomen and gradually tilt your or sweep your transducer upwards towards the upper mediastinum of the fetus. So in that way, you can acquire all these sections very appropriately. And remember, whenever you see something, please record it on the cine loop so that it will be extremely useful and that is very essential. Now coming to the visceral situs of the laterality of the fetus. This is one of the most important basic things that we need to identify as far as the fetal heart is concerned. The reason is that there are various methods by which you can identify the laterality. I'll tell you one of the small, uh, simplest methods which I always follow is that you need three factors in order to identify the laterality of the fetus. One is the presentation of the fetus, whether it is cephalic or rich lie of the fetus whether it is transverse or longitudinal and at the same time the most important thing is the relationship of the fetal spine to the maternal spine. If you imagine yourself in that position, suppose if the fetus is in cephalic position, longitudinal lie prone, that is the fetal spine is away from the maternal spine, you lie down in that position, 
I mean, imagine yourself lying down at the side of the patient in that position. Then you know which is your left and which is your right, and that will be the left and right of the fetus. So that is the simplest way of identifying the laterality of the fetus. Then comes the four chamber view. Typically, this is very easy to obtain. Quite often, you can easily get this one, and it is the transsection or the axial section of the thorax. Initially, a good abdominal perimeter has to be obtained, and then the probe has to be slid upwards, as I have already told you. And this is basically the way you are going to do: start from the fetal abdomen, go up, and then identify the fetal heart four chambers, and so that you can identify all the chambers. And I will tell you what are the things that you are going to look for as far as the four chamber view is concerned: the number of chambers, whether the four chambers are there or not, then the comparison comparison of the chambers, that is, whether there is any chamber asymmetry. then we would like to know the morphology of the chambers we have to identify the morphology because each of the chambers have got a specific morphology by which you can identify the chamber even if you don't know or you you are not aware whether it is right or left then we need to identify the coronary sinus then the crux of the heart which is extremely important uh, uh, component of the fetal four chamber view which tells us a lot about uh, various uh, endomyocardial cushion defects then we they need to identify the ventricular septum and then the atrioventricular valves the location the type of movement and then the flow across the valves and area behind the heart is extremely important and then connection of at least two pulmonary veins into the left atrium and presence or absence of the pericardial effusion and masses now when it comes to pericardial effusion remember you you uh, uh, attribute normally also there will be some amount of pericardial fluid but then whenever the fluid is more than 2 mm and at the same time it extends beyond the atrioventricular groove then only you call it as pathological if not you don't call it as pathological that is one important message that you have to keep in mind now coming to the various structures that we are first and foremost thing when you are trying to evaluate the chambers of the fourth chamber the easiest way is to identify the relationship with the adjacent structure anatomical structures for example the posterior most chamber is the left atrium the anterior most chamber is the right atrium right ventricle which is closest to the sternum and here it is close the the right left atrium is closest to the vertebral body and the descending aorta this is one the second important thing is trying to identify the outflow tracts that is to tilt the transducer or you can sweep the transducer in such a way that you can see a smooth cavity with the outflow tract which is, which has to be a left ventricle and uh, when you have this sort of an appearance where it is coming from the anteriorly placed chamber with a morbid um, moderate arc band that should be the pulmonary vein pulmonary artery and not only that this pulmonary artery can be identified because it bifurcates the bifurcating vessel which is coming out of the fetal heart it has to be pulmonary artery the one which the vessel which does not bifurcate but when it turns into an arch it gives off three neck vessels that is the aorta then we have to think in terms of the 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 atrioventricular valves wherein you can see the atrioventricular valves clearly as as we all know the the tricuspid valves are a one step below there will be an offset between the mitral and the tricuspid valve and that offset has to be maintained and that's an extremely important thing which will tell us that that, that particular valve is the tricuspid valve then we need to identify the opening of the pulmonary veins as well as the foramen of uh, Oval, which always flaps into the left atrium. So that is that is the flow of direction from the right atrium to the left atrium. That's why the foramen or flap of foramen oval flaps into the left atrium. And then we have to identify the chamber morphology, where we all know that the right ventricle is uh, has a thicker wall with moderate arc band and a smaller cavity, whereas the left ventricle is the one which has a smoother wall with a with a uh, with a larger cavity. So these are the morphological features. Not only that, you also have the uh, the uh, cardiac tendon. At the same time, insertions into the valves also can also help us in identifying these uh, um, valves. Now chambers. Now next comes the outflow tracts. In the outflow tracts, you can identify the left ventricle because it is a smooth wall, the large chamber, and the one which is going away. And this is the one which actually gives us what you call as the five chamber. The root of the aorta. is the one which gives you what is called as the five chamber view of the heart normally we have four chambers once you hide identify the fourth chamber that is the root of the aorta you call it as a five chamber view and it is extremely useful because first and foremost thing as you can see here you can see what is called as the aortoseptal continuity this is an extremely important thing that you have to identify every time you see the fear left ventricular outflow tract because any discontinuity in this will definitely tell us that there is some abnormality at the at the in the ventricular septum that is one 
Two, the lateral four chamber view is extremely important. Three is that when you once establish this uh, uh, the aortoceptal continuity, if it is not in alignment and if there is a this this is the normal angle that it has to su su sustain. But if it is this angle, this obtuse angle is altered, then you know that there is a overriding of the iota. So these are the things that will help us in identifying uh, I mean using this outflow track. Now coming to the pulmonary arteries, we know as I said. It is from the thick wall, small cavity. You can see the moderator band. You can also see the pulmonary valves, which can be seen as a tiny speckles there. And as you trace it upwards, you can see that it is going to bifurcate. And this is the one which tells us that, that it is a pulmonary artery and its outflow tracks can be evaluated. Now coming to the three vessel trachea view, which is one of the most important. Things. Suppose if I am hard pressed for time and at the same time, I want to finish off the case and I want to gather as much information as possible. There are, there are two things that we can definitely do. One is the four chamber view and third one, second one is the three vessel trachea view. But then it doesn't mean that you should cut corners, but it, it, is, it is always advisable to do all these sections. But in case if you want to reevaluate, then this is the best method of doing it, where you can identify the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery, uh, I'll show you. This is, the, uh, when, uh, this is the four chamber view, as you can see now, the left ventricular outflow, that is the that is, the that is the pulmonary artery, that is the aorta as well as the superior vena cava. Now, as you know, the points which we have to consider is that when you take the coronal section, the, just coronal to the three vessel view, coronal section to the three vessel view is the three vessel trachea view, where you can easily identify the pulmonary artery, aorta and the superior vena cava. Remember, the pulmonary artery as well as the aorta we should always be to the left of the trachea. This is an extremely important factor that we should remember. Not only that, we should always have three vessels, not two vessels or not four vessels. So that is one thing which also helps us in identifying by doing this three vessel trachea view. The implications of these two vessels or three vessels, you all, I mean, that's a little extended thing, but basically this is what you are going to look for. Once you have a suspicion, then you are going to extend your examination to various other sec parts and that's how you can come to a diagnosis. Now in the three vessel trachea view, the points which we are going to look for is the relationship from left to right and anterior to posterior of these great vessels at the pulmonary artery iota and the and the superior vena cava the size of the vessels it is usually left to right is the pulmonary artery iota superior vena cava the same way the, the pulmonary artery iota and superior vena cava anterior to posterior the size of the vessel the largest is the pulmonary artery second largest is the iota smallest is the superior vena cava shape is dash dot dot that is the pulmonary artery is usually appears like a line uh, the iota and the uh, sorry iota and the superior vena cava appear like a dot direction of flow usually both the uh, the ductus are, uh, ductus as well as the uh, aortic arch flows towards the transducer so that is one thing which also tells us whenever there is an alteration in the flow direction it indicates that there is a reversal of flow now uh, the other important factor which we also have to keep in mind is that uh, the crossover this is very very important as you can see here you can see that the left ventricular outflow tract, that is the iota, is directed towards the right shoulder, whereas the right ventricular outflow tract, that is the pulmonary artery, is directed towards the left shoulder. So this sort of a crisscross has to be established in order to ascertain that there is a normalcy of these particular vessels. So these are all the factors that you are going to look for as far as the fetal heart is concerned. Now coming to the lungs, as I said, the sagittal section is an extremely important one because you can take this as a sagittal section where echogenic lung and the liver. So because of this uh, disparity in the echogenicity, you can identify the diaphragm the same way onto the left side where you have the stomach splee, uh, spleen and at the same time you have the fetal uh, heart and echogenic lung and then the, uh, the hypoechoic spleen. Now we can take a transverse section which also helps us in identifying the echogenic lung on either side. Remember when you draw a line at the midpoint, you have two thirds of the heart to the left and one third of the heart to the right. This is one thing which tells us whether there is any media stomach shift or not. So this is extremely important. Not only you can also identify the axis of the heart by drawing a line from the vertebral body to the sternum and then drawing another line all along the interventricular septum which crosses or cut, cuts across this uh, line which has been drawn from the vertebral body to the sternum which forms the axis of the heart. So these are the factors that you have to look for. Now coming to the abdominal circumference, the transverse section of the abdomen where First and foremost thing which you are going to look for is the stomach as well as the umbilical vein. As you can see the umbilical vein taking the left turn which is called as the hockey stick appearance which is usually used for the 
uh, abdominal circumference, but the normalcy of all uh, the structures can also be identified. Presence of the stomach or absence, the size of the stomach, which is usually subject to. There are measurements, but we always do by subject to method. And then, uh, then we have the, uh, the the anterior abdominal wall, where you can see a nice insertion, smooth insertion of the umbilical cord without any other extra extra umbilical masses present. So this is an extremely important thing. Why is this important? The reason is that identifying the abnormal insertion of the umbilical cord into the anterior abdominal wall rules out anterior abdominal wall defects like supraumbilical, umbilical, and infraumbilical. Uh, abdominal wall uh, abnormalities can be identified by just this one particular uh, feature. Now then comes the, the pelvis where you can identify the fluid filled bladder. At the same time put the color doppler on, you can see two supravesical arteries or the umbilical arteries which are uh, skirting the bladder. This can give you a clue regarding the, the two vessel or three vessel cord of the umbilical, uh, two vessel or three vessel umbilical cord. Now, then comes, as I said, this in the stomach, in the abdomen, the first and foremost thing is the presence or absence of the stomach, porto umbilical junction, bubble, whether it is normal or dilated, or sometimes you can even nicely see the peristalsis within the small bubble loops. Both the kidneys should be present and should be identified. Presence of the bladder as well as the skirting supravesical arteries and the card insertion. Gallbladder quite often can be seen. But uh, off late, we have been a little more worried about identifying the gallbladder because sometimes some of the literature says that absence of demonstration of gallbladder in repeated examination uh, has an implication that we are dealing with the probable biliary atresias. But then it has still to be proved. Uh, the second important thing is the fetal kidneys. Fetal kidneys, again, have to be evaluated in both sagittal as well as the cross uh, transverse section. In the trans uh, sagittal section, you can see the upper pole and the lighter lower pole. Not only that, you can see a cap-like hyperechoic structure, which is because of the adrenals. Now, here, this is the trans section. This is the vertebral body. That is the shadow that is being thrown. And that is the stomach. And you can see the, the configuration of the, the fetal kidneys. Not only that, you can see hypoechoic cortex and the collecting system at the center. Many abnormalities of this can be easily identified. Most important thing is identifying the renal pelvis, measuring, taking the measurement of the anterior posterior diameter of the renal pelvis, which should be also considered. But then remember, quite often, most of them, we follow them up and uh, uh, quite often they are insignificant and there is spontaneous regression. But then if the AP diameter of the renal pelvis is more than 10 millimeters, definitely you need to do a postnatal scan in order to assess uh, the possibility of a uh, pelvic urethral junction obstruction. Now, a little scan, a section, little above, you can see the, the adrenals as a semicircular structures on either sides of the vertebral bodies. And this can also be identified on the sagittal section, just above uh, the kidney as a cap. Now, sometimes you can even put the color doctor on in order to identify the kidneys nicely seen. At the same time, you can see the renal arteries on either sides. And uh, you uh, um, and not only that, you can see the bifurcation of the aorta. This is basically used in order to identify the renal arteries, which in turn tells us the presence or absence of the fetal kidneys. Uh, if whether it is unilateral, which is bilateral, you don't find the renal arteries in a renal agenesis. So that helps us in confirming the diagnosis of a renal agenesis. Now coming to the long bones, we as I said, the first and foremost thing is to measure the long femur length on both sides. That's an extremely important exercise. I've been repeatedly telling you because sometimes we burn our fingers because you see one femur, measure the one and be happy with it. You know you, the opposite femur will be hypoplastic, which will get you into trouble. And the other things are the identification of three bones, uh, both in the legs as well as the, uh, uh, the upper limbs. And not only that, you need to identify the relationship between the or alignment between the foot and the leg and alignment between the hand and the and the forearm. So that's an extremely important factor that you need to keep in mind. Now, the points that we need to consider whenever we are trying to evaluate the musculoskeletal system is the first and foremost thing is the length, that is the size. The second important thing is the mineralization. The third one is whether there is any bowing or molding deformity, and then the alignment between the segments. And wherever it is possible, hands and feet should be separately imaged whenever possible, try to image the fingers as well as the toes. Now, this is typically the most important thing is the fetal face, which is a little tricky and mm, troublesome at times, uh, because unless the baby shows its face properly, uh, there is no way that you can identify that. The first and foremost thing is the coronal plane, where you can use the coronal plane to identify the nose, uh, the nostrils, 
upper lip, lower lip and the chin. As you can see here, this is a typical example where you have the nose, you can see the nostrils, that is the upper lip, that is the lower lip and that is the chin. So this is, this is one thing. Next, the another important thing is getting the orbits into focus where you can, we can identify the size of the orbits, contours of the orbits and then the interorbital distance and presence and absence of the uh, lens, not only the absence but also the echogenesis or translucency of the lens is important. If it is echogenic, we need to think in terms of a um, uh, 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 cataract. Now, the mid fa uh, median facial profile is again an important one where you can see the, the frontal bone configuration, whether there is any bossing of the frontal bone or sloping frontal bone. And not only that, you have to identify this small lucency between the nasal bone as well as the frontal bone. I try to identify the nasal bone in total, tip of the nose, and in this particular view, it is extremely important that you can even identify the heart palate very beautifully demonstrated. And not only that, you can also use what is called as the, uh, the premolar, um, um, premaxillary triangle, where you can see the, 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 the heart palate. And another important view is uh, identifying the heart palate. I'll show you in the next slide where we can easily identify the heart palate in a different configuration. Now, this is the typical uh, upper lip, nose, um, nose, upper lip and the palate where this is the premaxillary triangle, that is the palate. And this is the one where you are seeing from below upwards, that is from behind, lower, uh, inferior to the mandible, you are directing your ultrasound beam towards the fetal cranium when you can see the heart palate very beautifully. These are all the molar ridges which is can seen beautifully and that is the upper lip. So this is how you try to evaluate the fetal palate. Now coming to the orbits, as I said, most important thing is the the size of the orbits, the contours of the orbits, and then the interorbital distance. Interorbital distance should accommodate one more orbit. Not only that, you can also see the lens, which are usually hypoechoic or lucent, and then they are opaque, they are abnormal. Now, coming to the fetal nose and the palate, which you can see beautifully like this, wherein, remember, it is just a, I mean, a, a cursory number that you need to remember is at about 18 weeks of gestation, the nasal bone is usually about 4.4 because in the first trimester, we will say whether the nasal bone is present or absent. Whereas in the second trimester onwards, you try to tell whether the bone is normal size or it is small. So hypoplasia, absent or normal sized bone. So the normal size at about 18 weeks is about 4.4. At about 20 weeks, it is about 5. And not only that, this particular view is also useful, as I said, for evaluating the frontal region, whether there is any frontal bossing or sloping. And, and uh, not only that, you draw a line all along it. When you draw a line, if it, the line is passing through the nose as well as the frontal region, you know if it, the chin is receding back, then you need to think in terms of a microgonathia. But then there are various other measurements that also can be taken in order to identify microgonathia. Now, Coming to other aspects, whenever you do the, the, the scan or the evaluation of the placenta, its location, its echo texture, its retroplacental complex has to be evaluated whenever you do the evaluate the, the placenta. The size of the placenta also is extremely, is sometimes considered important in particular say, clinical situations. Now coming to the cervix, first and foremost thing, identifying the internal loss and then measuring the cervical canal length. Remember, the cervical canal length best is evaluated by doing a transvaginal examination and not transabdominal. But then you can't do a transvaginal examination for every patient which has been sent to you for a, a TFA scan or a normally scan in the mid trimester. So there are certain parameters by which you can categorize them when to do a transvaginal and when to do a transabdominal. Basically, when you have a previous history of preterm deliveries, or basically when you have an equivocal sized uh, internal loss or the funneling of the internal loss as well as the cervical canal length or when you have a threatened preterm labor, labor that is that's at that time the symptomatology is suggested in that situation definitely you need to do a transvaginal examination of the cervix now identifying putting the color doppler at the internal loss will always help us because identifying a vessel which is interposing between the presenting part of this fetus and this internal loss is extremely important because this is going to cause problems during delivery. Now, this is about the placenta location. This is the placental echo texture and that is the retroplacental area. This is the placenta previa where it is sitting right on top of the internal loss and also uh, assessment of the amniotic fluid. This can be done by two ways. One is the deep vertical pocket 
quite often we uh, we do what is called as the four quarter and you assessment that is what is called as annual liquidity index so these are all the various things that we need to evaluate now to summarize the whole thing as i said the two sweeps and 20 plane approach it provides a very logical structured method of evaluating the fetal structures and that will actually save you time if you go methodically doing the two sweeps as well as the 20 planes i'm sure you are not going to miss anything at the same time if it becomes a drill then you are going to save a lot of time in examining the fetus in the mid trimester now correct evaluation of fetal anatomy is very important more important than following order of examination that's what i told you that don't go always by the order of examination the reason is that uh, you may not again get the fetal heart in proper position or the fetal face in proper position not only that, you need to detect the normal variation, identify the normal variation. At the same time, lesions which cannot be confirmed on the basic examination has to be referred. This is one thing which we have to get into the habit. Now, to wrap up, we have what's called as the 2 to 20 percent approach, which is a very novel method. And we always remember that you need to magnify the image whenever you are doing a trimester scan. Take cine loops as much as possible. Specifically, the fetal heart document all the 20 plates. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for the enlightening uh, session. Uh, we, we got an overwhelming response with around uh, 1,800 plus attendees for this session. So even now, there are around 1,820 participants. Okay, so, sir, a lot of... Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Great response. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, questions in the comment ses session uh, to uh, Dr. T. L. N. Praveen, sir. So I'll just pick up a few of the clinical questions. And uh, and then the rest of the questions we'll compile and I will request Dr. T. L. N. to answer most of them. And then we'll pass it on to the, uh, the attendees who have asked the question. So, sir, one of the questions asked by Dr. Ravindra uh, is, is Doppler indicated even without IUGR routinely in third trimester? Um, yeah, you see, I think we I think we have come to a stage where, along with uh, in the third trimester, not only that it is another another chance to see for the anomalies, but more than that, the trim third trimester scan is basically intended intended to evaluate the growth pattern. Whenever we do a growth pattern. The evaluation of fetal growth is not complete unless you do a multi-vessel Doppler. So that is the reason why, see, when do you suspect an IUGR? Unless you have an IUGR, I mean, there is no way that you can suspect just an IUGR just because you have a small uh, small fetus. So it has to be always coupled with uh, doing a multi-vessel Doppler. I mean, I practice always doing a, a growth evaluation as well as the multi-vessel Doppler. And I advise that it is better to do that because we are much more safer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so another question from Dr. Sangeeta Chaudhary, ma'am. It says, uh, what is uh, the trick to see, I think it says DV and tricuspid flow, especially when the baby is supine? No, no, I, I come again. I, I, I couldn't get your question. What is the? Uh, uh, the trick, the trick to see uh, DV and tricuspid flow. Especially oh. when the baby is supine. Uh, pray, pray, pray that the baby turns. Uh, I mean, if it is supine, um, it is good for the ductus venosus. Uh, whereas, whenever you try to evaluate the tricuspid valve, you need to have a four chamber view, isn't it? You need to have a four chamber view, magnify the four chamber view. When you magnify the four chamber view, quite often if it is supine, that much more is useful because so straight away you can see the uh, the fetal heart. That is what is called as the apical four chamber view. And ideally, if you have a supine fetus, it is very good because the ductus venosus can be seen nicely. At the same time, the tricuspid valve can be seen nicely. There, there is no tricks or anything. Um, as far as the ductus venosus is concerned, you know, you need to put your sample which should be small, it is about 1 to 0 0.7 and at the same time it should be placed at the point where there is aliasing. Whereas in the tricuspid valve, you need to have a larger sample volume where if, or a bigger gate where you can put one limb of the, uh, of the gate in the right ventricle and the other limb in the, uh, the right atrium so that you are assessing the flow of the tricuspid valve. Yeah, sir, yeah. Another question from Dr. Uh, Rishabh Agarwal. 19 weeks with anhydramnios, 
how to ac access congenital anomalies right whenever we have oligohydramnios that's what you mean anhydramnios isn't it so whenever yeah. we have oligohydramnios there are three things that we need to look for first and foremost thing is renal renal and renal that is one thing which you have to rule out so the possibility of a renal agenesis vertically when you have a oligohydramnios it is very really difficult to assess the fetal kidneys but and not only that another uh, great problem which we are going to face is that because the renal photos are empty the adrenals come and lie down in that one and they become hypertrophied and they look like kidneys this is what is called as the laid back adrenals in that situation when you put the color doppler on and if you don't find the renal arteries you are more or less sure that you are dealing with uh, uh, renal agenesis associated with oligohydramnios the second important thing is pro in premature rupture of membranes you take the history from the patient she will tell you whether there is any previous i mean uh, rupture or the leaking of uh, fluid the third important thing is growth restricted fetus so when you have a growth i mean the fetus where the kidneys are normal there is no history of uh, any leak in that situation you need to think in terms of a possible growth restricted fetus and then further evaluate them right uh, <clears throat> dr neha uh, she has a question how to evaluate fetal adrenal glands uh, please repeat right now now um, the most important thing that we should understand is the fetal adrenals are seen well when the fetus is in prone position the reason is that when the fetus is in prone position as you are moving your transducer from the fetal thorax down into the abdomen that is the time when you find a dense shadowing from the vertebral body on either sides you find curvy linear hypoechoic with a central hyperechoic areas on either sides of the spine which are adrenals now to reconfirm that one you turn your transducer at that in a sagittal plane or 90 degrees then you can see the fetal kidneys as well as the hypoechoic uh, uh, caps on both the kidneys on either sides uh, which will uh, so one i mean when we are doing a sagittal section it will be on either side there is one on to the right side and one on to the left side you have to move your transducer and get that one but in the transverse section you can see both the adrenals right uh Uh, I think we can take two, three more questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sir, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctor, yeah, Doctor A Vijay has asked, uh, do we have to see uh, pina anal opening? Ah, right. Very good question. Um, yes, I mean uh, now, 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 most often we do include the evaluation of the anal orifice, particularly the sphincter, anal sphincter. It is extremely easy once you get into the fetal bladder. you slid your transducer little more cordially and try to image the perineum invariably you definitely see the fetal gender but then that you cannot help so when you move the transducer down towards the perineum at that region you find what is called as a donut appearance donut appearance in sense there will be a hypoechoic rim with a hyperechoic center which is because of the mucosa or the the anal canal so that is how you identify the anal anal sphincter right uh uh doctor uh, satyadev sharma sir has asked should we include tvs to measure cervical length in mid trimester anomaly scan routinely no no that's what i told very clearly it is very difficult so for every uh, patient who comes to you for a uh, anomaly scan at uh, let us say 20 weeks of gestation you can't convince them to do a transvaginal examination just for the cervical canal line so what we do is we normally do a transabdominal scan with an optimal filled bladder if we can identify optimally the the size of the cervical canal then we don't worry and we always take the history into consideration whether there was any preterm delivery previously uh, or the or a spontaneous preterm labor and then at the same time any features of threatened uh, threatened labor and at the same time whether this size which we have measured is equivocal where we are not very sure which is borderline and we want to be very sure then you do a transvaginal or else we don't do yeah uh, a question from dr suresh from vizag what is the criteria for bowel dilatation in fetus um see there are various objective criteria where you measure the bowel wall i mean the lumen also the thickness of the bowel wall but then it is not it's not that appropriate to always try to measure and try to use the statistics into consideration it's always a subjective method 
you know whenever the bowel is dilated first and foremost thing there will be a lot of particulate movement there will be decreased peristalsis associated with it if it is the upper ga abnormalities up to the jejuno jejuno ileal junction positively you do have a polyhydramnia so you need to take various factors into consideration just because you have measured 6 mm and if it is become 6.2 mm you can't call it as normal or abnormal so that is not the criteria which we would like to take now for example the same way the colon 23 mm anything more than that and this is little ridiculous in sense it is difficult to really convince yourself it is always the uh, um, comprehensive features which you take into consideration before you label them as dilated or not dilated right so sir i i think uh, there are a lot of comments I, we will get it compiled and uh, yeah. try to see once yeah. you answer we we'll thank you so, thank uh, you mahendra thank you, thank you. Uh, gautam i mean ga 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 nice of you Uh, gaurav and uh, it was wonderful having this uh, webinar and thanks yeah. everyone for uh, attending this one thank you once again yeah, sir. good night sir, it has been, yeah thanks sir it has been a overwhelming response and uh, sonoscape as a educational partner i think we have lined up several similar enlightening uh, sessions which will keep you updated thank you sir again thank, thank you. you everyone for joining for your time thanks thanks